And good evening and welcome to Raconteur's News, as uh, Susie so succinctly puts it there uh, uh, on the intro. It is uh, Thursday night, it's referendum day and we are all brexited here at uh, uh, on Raconteur's News. We hope oh, you've been out and voted. If you haven't been out and voted, then please get yourself out to vote, vote um well, vote with your heart, really, but um, as long as it's exit. I went in to vote earlier on, and one of the girl, a, a young lady in front of me said to the, the people, do I pop this in here, um, talking about her vote, in, and does she put it into the ballot box? And I said, I said, yes, you put it in there, unless it's a vote remain, in which case it goes in this bin here. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we've, uh, we, we, hopefully... If all things being equal, I think we're on our way out. But uh, as we know, things aren't really equal. Uh, well, I'm Jason Holmes. This is Raconteurs News. We're broadcasting live on this Thursday night uh, from raconteursnews.com and also on Spreaker as well. And as usual, Andy Young is here with me as well. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing great, Jason, which is better than I could say for the weather. Did you see... Um... Strangely enough, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but uh, the reports on the south coast this morning that they had one month's rain in one hour. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of roads are flooded and also part of the tube network. So a lot of people ain't going to be able to get home in time to vote. Yeah, but uh, but apparently there have been a lot of companies that have been sending their um, employees home early due to the inclement weather down in the southeast. That's what I've heard. This is all the the nonsense on the on the news. A bit like when you was up. at school and it snowed, and you had That's, to go on a you had to go on the bus, so they sent you home early. Is it like that? I think it's some, I think it's somewhat like that. Yeah, I think either either the the water pipes are frozen up or or, or whatever. Um, yeah, but it's it's certainly been an interesting day. There's been a lot of things going on, and we, it looks like we've got another shooter, lone shooter at a um, at a public place somewhere in Germany. But we'll have to wait until everything develops from that and see whether that's of any significance. But uh, tonight we are joined by author John Hamer, who's here to tell us about his new book. His new book is out at the moment. It came out uh, I think about May time. How are you doing, John? How, how are you? I'm good, Jason. Thanks. How are you both? We're good, yeah, mate. We're, Thanks, John. Yeah, That's we're great. pretty good. We're sleeping with our head ten inches above, uh, six inches above our feet. So we're we're, we're all very, very, very well here uh, tonight. So let's uh, let's kick off. Give us your take on the referendum, just for a quick start, just to get it out of the way. Then we can we can concentrate on your book. Right. OK. No punches pulled. I don't have to be uh, politically correct or anything. No, you can do what right. you say. Well, what you I, con want. I concur with what you said. Absolutely. You know, um, let's get out. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I think the thing will be rigged. Um, I don't think that we'll, we'll come out, even if the even if the vote is, um, you know, is for actually leaving. Uh, I, I've been using this quote uh, quite a few times. In the last few days, but it's a it's a quote from a certain Mr. Joseph Stalin, who one or two people may have heard of, and he said famously, "It's not the votes that count; it's who counts the votes," and that just sums it up for me because uh, they ain't going to let us leave. Whatever happens, they are not going to let us leave because it's just too big a part of the agenda, basically. Yeah, yeah. words of wisdom from the original smoking Joe there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't agree with that many things that he said, but that's probably one of them. <laughs> yeah. Super. So, uh, uh, so, so you're not um, you're you're not anticipating tomorrow morning we're all going to wake up and everybody's going to they they all over the news it's going to say we are out of Europe. No. No. <laughs> In a word, no. I, I I just can't cannot see it. I mean, if if that is the case. And I, I, it's highly unlikely, but I reckon if that is the case, the, the same thing will happen as happened in Ireland over in a similar set, similar set of circumstances. They'll just have the vote again until it, till they get the result that they want. But I don't yeah. think they'll need to do that because when you're rigging it, you don't need to do that, do you? So there you go. Yeah, just, th there's been a history of that. I know that, that it happened in Ireland, didn't it, with the Lisbon Treaty? They they they, they said to them, "Ah, sorry, you got that one wrong." Yeah. When you exactly. answered the first time, and then. Uh, 
they did it yeah. until um, until really they got they got the answer that they wanted. Yeah, and apparently all the early exit polls are saying it's going to be leave, but of course there's exactly the same thing happened over the uh, you know Scotland leave in the UK, didn't it? And uh, all the exit polls, and to be fair, they've got these exit polls off to a a very fine art, so they, they're, they're highly scientific, and they, and they know they should be very accurate. So it's it, it, it's a bit of a surprise, actually, in one sense, that uh, you know that never happened because the exit polls for, for Scotland coming out were something like fifty five percent in favour of coming out, and yet I think the final result was just the opposite. I think it was fifty five percent in favour. Total fix. Yeah, I, so, I'm, I'm not sure about all these polls, John. The ones that I know are usually under somebody's kitchen cupboard fixing their sink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. You, you yeah. xenophobic outer there, you you, you xenophobic zen, xenophobic fool. That's what they'd, you'd be accused of by, uh, by by the BBC, particularly for yeah. saying something like that. I'm but not... Any, it's racism. Anybody, I mean, you know, let's... You know, let's use the the word that they would use. They would say racist. They wouldn't use anything posh like xenophobe. You know, because racism is a is, is sort of being inured into our society now, isn't it? Because you know, to, to, it's to stave off criticism on immigration. Basically, that's what that's what the word racism is all about. And also to prevent anyone ever criticizing Israel, because uh, yes, a lot of countries will go to prison for that now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And rightly in... so, uh, you know, you should go to prison for things that you, that come out of your mouth, um, thought crimes, as it were. Anyway, I think we should uh, we should move move <laughs> on just a, a little bit. Um, a little diversion now, isn't it? But mind. <laughs> yeah, well, we got you on because uh, you're a bit of a raconteur when it comes to um, to to, to um, school duggery and, uh, and and things that uh, that are not quite right. And you've written a couple of books. Uh, one's the RMS Olympic, which is all about the Titanic incident and. Uh, of course, how it was switched uh, in your in in your book, um, and also of course the falsification of history. Now I understand yeah. you've just had uh, you've just published another book. Um, do you want right. to tell us about that? Yeah, I mean obviously it's a very big book. You know, it's eleven hundred pages and it's about ten inches by seven inches. It's about three inches thick or more. So it's it's a big book and it's hard to summarise in a few sentences, but I'll, I'll do my best. I, I mean, the, the angle that I'm coming from really is, I mean, it's similar in a lot of ways to falsification of history. I cover some of the same topics, but I also go a lot further than that now because I, as time's gone on, I think what I've, you know, from a personal point of view, I've actually uh, come to a, not a different conclusion, but a, I've sort of refined my conclusions now to say, exactly how and why it's being done and by whom okay in falsification of history it was just this nebulous them that were doing it whereas now i think i've got a, a proper handle on exactly who's doing it i think we've always known why but i think I've, I've sort of tried to narrow it down a little bit as to who it is and i reckon the premise of the book is that it's it, it's it's the big bankers that, that that are behind it all. I mean, the, people tell you it's the Jews, it's the Jesuits, it's the Illuminati, it's it's this secret controllers of the world or whatever. It's just a label, really. But the, like I said, the premise of the book is that um, I, I pin the blame on the people who run the banks. But I suppose, in a sense, that's not surprising because the people who run the banks run everything else as well. Because if you follow all the pyramids... In society, right to the top, it's the same people at the apex, you know, of every single, um, you know, pyramidal structure that you can think of within society, whether that be companies, secret societies, uh, you, you name it. Uh, it's absolutely the same people, the same families at the very top. Do, but, do you think, do you think uh, in recent years it's become uh, not so secret? It's the, the, the cat is sort of getting out of the bag. A little bit, but I mean, you still get, if you, if you dare to sort of broach the subject, you still get labelled with the, uh, you know, the, the epithet conspiracy theorist. And and speaking about definitions, I I, uh, I got I had a good definition of uh, a conspiracy theorist given to me the other day as well, which I'd like to share, and that was somebody who doesn't watch as much television as you do. That's a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. Uh, which takes a little bit of thinking about, but you get there in the end. <laughs> it's a bit, 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but what I was, sorry, what I was going to carry on to say was that, um, stop me if I ramble on, because I know, I know I do tend to ramble sometimes, but um, the, I've sort of pinned it on, on the bankers because what I believe is that it was actually the taking over of the, uh, the ability to create money from nothing which is what these people did many centuries ago and have slowly, slowly, slowly over time got to the point where that allowed them to generate so much money that they could buy everything else. So that's why I've pinned it on the bankers, if you like. But these bankers, you could call them anything. Um, but, uh, you know, I believe that the whole thing started and was facilitated by the corruption in the monetary system. Mm. Yeah, it certainly seems that way to me, John. And uh, we, we couldn't have planned it better. Um, we, we've we got a, a guy that we speak to more or less on a monthly basis uh, called Paul, our, our high-level financial insider. I've been speaking to Paul for close on three years now. And for some reason, he couldn't make his um, June update. or Was it the May update? He couldn't make we had, we had to cancel at the last minute because uh, he had family problems and uh, we had to slot him in somewhere and we booked up till the middle of next month so uh, I said oh what about doing Wednesday and he said yeah yeah no problem do that and didn't realize till halfway through the show next last night we've got him talking about the impending collapse of the financial industry and then you on the following night so it couldn't have worked out better really yeah, it, it, right, it is. Right. Uh, um, sorry, we, we've not mentioned your book, your new book, up till yet. It's uh, it's called Behind the Curtain: A Chilling Expose of the Banking Industry. It's volume one, so uh, there's going to be more to come as well. So, what sort of subjects do you cover it in this book? Um, well, within the um, within the banking thing. Yeah, the back behind the curtain. Yeah. Behind the curtain. Yeah, it's um, well. It's Virtually everything. I mean, it's just the whole, I suppose you could call it the grand conspiracy. Um, just basically using the bankers as the scapegoats, if you like. Um, just explaining how everything that is going on in the world relates back. Well, I think we lost you a bit there. Um, uh, how was that your end, Andy? Are you, are you still there, John? Yeah, it was just cutting out moments. So first of all, it goes on about the usurpation of the, of the control of money. And then it moves to, yeah, I'm, I'll tell you, yeah, I'll, could you just talk amongst yourself for two seconds? Because I've got a little problem this end, actually, sorry. Yeah, I need no to, problem. Um, I'm not at home, so I need to grab some more data. I beg your pardon about this. I, not a problem, John, not a problem. Yeah, just, just give me two minutes. Sorry, guys, I do apologise. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we could talk amongst ourselves, can't we? Yeah, I was, I was looking through the um, preview bit on Amazon earlier on. And uh, I did see uh, in the, uh, what was it called, the foreword, talking about Jerome Daly, a, a lawyer by profession who defended himself against the bank's attempted foreclosure on his $14,000 mortgage on the grounds that there was no consideration for the loan. Uh, consideration in legalese refers to the item exchanged and is an essential part of any legal contract. Being well, a contract can't exist without consideration. That's right, yeah, there's seven elements of contract law. Daly contended that the bank offered no consideration for this loan on the grounds that they'd created the money out of thin air by a bookkeeping entry, and had therefore not suffered a loss, another relevant point of the law, by his refusal or inability to pay back the money. And uh, he, he actually won that case, so th there is some precedent that, you know, basically mortgages are, uh, and loans are a bunch of hokum. Yeah, and they keep, they keep, they'll, they'll come up with some sort of, um, uh, where, where they'll say this loophole has been closed. Mm. They, because anytime anybody uh, challenges um, and wins, that then becomes what they call a loophole. And, and this loophole needs to be closed. So, um, yeah, well, it's a precedent um, and, it, and it is great, great news. Um, it, we still need to be cautious and, and keep paying our mortgage. Well, you know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't there's, advise there's still, it. People, there's still people trying to use it, but it, it, the problem with it is, is that um, 
the courts have been corrupted by it as well, by them as well now, and the courts are just, just putting every obstacle you can possibly think of in the way of it actually, of that defence actually succeeding, to the point where they've actually bent the law to uh, to make that the case, which I suppose is no surprise really, but there you go. Yeah, that's what they've done. It's, banking is just legalised theft, really, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure you agree with, with the, the research that you've done. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. So when you was uncovering all this um, this this banking stuff, how far did you find the the, the rabbit hole went? Very, very deep indeed. I mean, you know, even just the creation of money. You know, if you if you start there, I mean, that is completely illegal. Um, you know, the way the way that they do it. I mean, I'll, I'll outline that for the benefit of the listeners. If there are people out there who, who don't fully understand exactly how our money is created, um, well, first of all. That it's not government. It's not created by governments. The power to create and generate money and currency and print currency is not within the hands of governments. In the entire, there are only three countries in the world that don't have a central bank whose function it is to create money, and that is Iran, Syria, sorry, Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. The latest two dominoes to fall were Libya and Syria, and I think that speaks volumes anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's significant that the three that are left are the ones that are put up as being public enemies number one in the world. Okay, they're, they're the three peop- three countries that the Western world, for want of a better expression, is trying to subdue in, in whatever way it can, because basically they want to get a central bank in there. Now, what central banks do is they create money absolutely out of thin air, and they do that in the form of loans and mortgages. That's how money is actually generated. So... If, say, the government needs another £1 billion injected into the economy, it will go to the Bank of England, which, by the way, is a privately owned corporation whose shareholders are non-disclosed, and and ask them, go cap in hand and say, could we have a billion pounds, please? Yes, you can, but we need a billion pounds worth of government bonds in exchange for that, which are, you know, real. They do have a value of £1 billion. So then they, they, they create this money, paper money, which is not backed by anything at all, no gold, no silver, no nothing. It's just basically monopoly money. It, you know, the only reason that it's it's legal tender is because we believe it's legal tender and, and we're told it's legal tender. But it's, it's just worthless pieces of paper. I think I read somewhere it costs them about £180 to print a billion pounds worth of currency. So that's what it costs the central bank, £180. And then the government owes, owes them that £1 billion in government bonds, and they have to pay interest on that billion as well. Mm-hmm. But it's even worse than that, because when you go to a bank for a loan, you know, your local bank of NatWest or whatever, and say you want to borrow, I don't know, ten grand to buy a car, or a hundred grand on a mortgage or whatever, they don't have a pile of notes in a vault somewhere that they move somewhere into your account. It's just numbers on a computer screen. And before computers, it was just uh, ledger entries. But the brilliant thing for banks is that the, it, the way that they use the bookkeeping is totally fraudulent and it's totally against uh, uh, accountancy practice because what they do is, so you say so they've got a pot of 10 million to lend and you uh, borrow... I'll make it simpler. So they've got a pot of a million to lend and you borrow, want to borrow £100,000 for a house. They actually, What they actually should do is deduct that £100,000 from in double entry bookkeeping from the, uh, put it onto the debit side of the ledger. But what they actually do is put it onto the credit side of the ledger. So they, they then have £1.1 million instead of 900000 if that makes sense. But it's completely fraudulent what they do. And, Obviously, somebody knows that this is going on. I mean, auditors must check these these things. You know, it must, must be happening millions of times a day around the banking system of the world. But yet it still goes on. You know, where's the auditing? Or if there is auditing, it's completely fraudulent. Uh, but the best thing then, of course, for the man is it, not only have they lent you 100 grand that they've added to the credit side of their, uh, their bookkeeping system, but then you've got to pay interest on that 100 grand. And if you don't keep up with those interest payments on that 100 grand, 
the hundred grand that never existed in the first place, they'll come and take your property away, which has got a tangible value. And this is how they've gained control of the world through this practice over the centuries. And, and one by one, the dominoes have fallen in each country around the world and a central bank has been established. And well, as I said, there's only three countries in the entire world now that don't have a, uh, a Rothschild controlled central bank. So does Syria have a, a Rothschild bank? Because I was under, uh, yes. on, on the understanding that they didn't, and which is why they, they were still trying to... I'm, I'm actually doubting myself now, mate. I'm, I'm getting, I might be getting mixed up with Libya, actually, because that's what the incursion into Libya was, wasn't it? The, yeah. The, before they actually invaded Libya and and and, and uh, all that hoo ha there, they actually Libya Libyan rebels, would you believe? Before the West went in, set up a central bank because what's his name, Gaddafi, had already decided to um, start his own. Currency bypassing the the world, the, the IMF and the World Bank. Yeah, when when's it going to be a gold back dinar? Um, That's right. The Middle East. When, yeah. when, in, in fact, yeah. I think it was a, a an Ash. Um, he, he gave a speech, didn't he, at an African right. uh, leaders uh, convention, or uh, uh, where he said that uh, where he brought this up, this idea up. Yeah. Of and, the gold back dinar, and 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 I suppose yeah. that that's what. Um, signed his death warrant really just that, yeah i mean that was the same as kennedy and lincoln absolutely that was the straw that broke the camel's back and and what a lot of people don't know is that libya up, up until the death of um gaddafi was one of the most prosperous nations in the world they had free health care free dentists you know the the, the 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 it's a very affluent country but as soon as the central banks came in of course they suck all the wealth of the nation into their own uh, accounts did you do you think that in Libya, um, just be, I mean bef before uh, all this, the, the you know Gaddafi became bad again, he'd become good because Tony Blair was over there, and, and of course we had the in, the, uh, the the situation with Abdul Basit Ali Muhammad Al Megrahi, who was the uh, alleged Libyan bomber as well, yes. um, and he'd gone back as. Uh, 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 do you think that? They tried to charm Libya first, and then once they realised that wasn't happening, they decided to use the hammer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that, that's the, the the modus operandi. You know, they're sending a guy called an economic hitman. If anybody's ever read the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins, the American guy, it's absolutely fascinating. And that and that relates in great detail how they do it. They actually they send somebody in like him, and they offer the president or the they get, you know, their contact over there, the high level contact over there, all sorts of riches and blah, 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 basically to sell the country's soul to them. If they don't fall for that, then they start putting the pressure on. If they don't, like, you know, like sanctions, economic sanctions, all that stuff. And then if they don't, if they still don't play ball, they're dead. <laughs> and that happens time after time after time. It happened at all the South American countries in the 80s and the 90s, well, the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, and and Perkins was involved in a lot of that, and, it, and, and his book is quite revealing, actually. Um, so it, it's a recommended read because that ex exactly explains how they do it. Yeah, I, I've not read um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, but I have heard of, of it, and I have heard it being spoken about, and it's it, it's pretty sinister, isn't it? I mean, it it, yeah. it it goes into details about how they will go into a country. Um, um, th then what by whatever means they will get some sort of angle on on whoever's leading that country. Yeah. Um, and then lend yeah. them billions and billions of dollars that they could that never they pay, pay back, it. and then yeah. then uh, mop up the, the their natural yeah. resources. Yeah. Well, what they did in I think it was was it Nicaragua, um, might have been Nicaragua or Colombia. I can't remember one of the one of those places around that area. Uh, they actually uh, they took control of the water system and, 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 and quadrupled the price of water. And the people fought back, actually. It was never really sort of publicised, but the people fought back. And eventually, the people won. But um, it was a hell of a struggle, and there was a lot of people killed over it. But that's a typical sort of tactic. You know, OK, you can't pay the loans back. Well, we'll, we'll take over your water infrastructure then. We'll take over your, your power generation infrastructure, or both, or all of it. And that's how they do it. They suck up the wealth of a country and uh, 
you know, gain complete control in, in, in that way. And, and I think that's, you know, that sort of emphasizes the point that I made at, at the beginning, that it's the bankers, although you could you could attribute it to any number of different people, because, you know, not only the bankers, but they, they own most of the corporations as well. But as I keep saying, it's the facilitation of that, uh, the, the money, which gives them the power um, to do it. And that's why I sort of attribute it to the bankers. But we fall for it, don't we? Because we're we're quite, we're quite childish when it comes to um, when it comes to this sort of thing, and we don't really do as research. I mean, people will read on the news that Colonel Gaddafi's were a right bastard, or or, or you know yeah. he, he he murdered his people, and we have yeah. any evidence, and they'll actually believe yeah. that. No, absolutely. Uh, and so it 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 is a really a really sinister uh, situation. But do you do you think that they they try to wine and dine? Um, them uh well yeah. i think I, th- I think i i think you've already answered this sort of question yeah. but especially with gaddafi yeah they, they it, tried to wine and dine him he yeah. then uh spoken at a, a national uh an international african leaders mm-hmm. conference and yeah. then the next thing he's got a, a knife up his ass you know he's yeah. been killed by his own supposedly his own people as, as right. well this is another thing whereas yeah. I, I from what i've seen I don't think that anybody in Libya, any any right-minded Libyan, would have had a problem with Colonel Gaddafi. Yeah, was, I mean, all right, I'm sure he wasn't an angel. I mean, who is? And you know, everybody's going to have a little bit of a finger in 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 the tail, aren't they? Who's who's in a position to do that? Like I say, I'm sure he wasn't an angel, but I think he was basically an honourable guy because he wouldn't give in to them. He wouldn't he wouldn't allow them to come in, and you know, he, he put his people first, basically. Well, he'd probably put himself first, to be fair, but. He certainly put his people second, not bottom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, to, for Gaddafi, you've only got to take a look at the uh, footage of him when he was um, doing public appearances. You'd see him driving down the street in a, a car with his head stuck out the sunroof, uh, touching hands with the whole crowd. That's right. Um, whereas you don't see any Western leaders doing that. They're usually in a bulletproof limousine surrounded Absolutely. by hundreds of yeah. armed bodyguards. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas Gaddafi... I mean, also, look at Gaddafi's housing policy. Um, when yeah. he came to power, he swore that um, he wouldn't house his own parents until every That's last right. person in Libya had a home. And yeah. uh, apparently, he stuck to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, in fact, you know, there was... his dad died before he got home. He was housed. His I dad didn't... died before he was housed. That's, really, that, yeah. that, that's the that's just how far. I mean, again, yeah. this is this is things that I I'm I'm reading from different yeah. places, and I don't I I haven't got the the um the validation of them all, but it, it to me it just seems that there's two sides to every story, and Definitely. we only really ever get the the, the banker's side. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, it was the same to a lesser extent with Saddam Hussein as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay, again, not an angel by any stretch of the imagination. He feathered his own nest, of course, but it, you know, the people loved him compared to what they'd had, had to put up with under the, uh, you know, the previous regimes. I mean, he was he was a well respected man, and and uh, and as you said before, Andy, he could he could drive around in an open top limo as well, and you know, nobody was after him, nobody wanted to get rid of him. All that business about when the Americans went in and you saw the picture of them toppling that statue, it was all faked. Mm. It was all staged for the cameras because I've seen actual photographs of that from a different angle. There's only about 35 people there in the crowd. But they made it look like it was an entire mob, rampaging mob, rejoicing over his death. But it, they were apparently there were just a few people, a few dissidents, and most of them had been cajoled and paid by the CIA anyway to be there. Well, you, and, and, you look at sorry, um, sorry, mate. You look at Saddam, and he he was armed and supported by the West for most of his tenure, wasn't he? I mean, he uh, came to well, power in about fifty eight or fifty nine when yeah. I believe it was King Isidris went on holiday, and uh, Gaddafi saw his opportunity, jumped in there. Um, mm. I only know about that because I had a, an old German friend when I lived out in Spain and he was actually working in the oil industry in Libya at the time it happened. And um, oh. they actually threw everyone out of the country apart from the American, em- 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 American employees of the oil companies. Right. So that's quite um, 
telling of what was happening there, wasn't it? Absolutely, and 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 you know they, they keep these people they keep these people as long as they're useful to them, and then as soon as the, something happens and and it's expedient to bump them off, they'll just do that. You know, no no qualms, no, and but the, they they do a massive PR media job on him first, you know, to make him out to be the devil basically for a little while before it's sunk into the you know the, all our psyches, you know that oh. Saddam equals bad. Mm. America and Britain and Israel equals good. And, you know, once that's sort of, you know, been put into our heads for long enough and hard enough, then they'll do it and they can get away with it because people just say, well, he had, you know, he got what was coming to him. Mm. Well, well, yeah, you, it's perception management. You look at, management. You yes. look at, yeah. you look at um, not so long back, there were... Um, there was quite a lot of footage of uh, Tony Blair and uh, Gaddafi embracing and they were best buddies. Mm. But then suddenly he wants to create a golden dinar and boom, he's he's the bad guy. Absolutely, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like you said, with the, um, like with the toppling of the statue of Saddam that happened, yes. we all, we've all seen pictures of that and it, it, it appears from... from uh, the, the the angle that we're shown it, it that there's thousands of people there and it's something that's spontaneous. Yeah. But once you take a step back, uh, and you you see that there's just a very small group. Yeah. But again, it's perception management. But we're so yeah. susceptible to that in the West that that we yeah. will just see something and simply believe it. Yeah. Well, that's sixty odd years of TV for you because TV has spent the last sixty five years conditioning us to accept what we see. On a screen, if we see it on a screen, it's true. There's so yeah. many examples of green screening now in the news. You know, they, they just make situations up and they, and they show situations from different circumstances and pretend that these are completely new set of circumstances. By that, I mean that they, it might be a riot in Baghdad and they and they and they dress it up as a riot in Syria if it's expedient to do that and they want to demonize something in Syria, they don't care what footage they use to make the point. It's just, it's, they just use it. Uh, and, and as I say, you know, TV has unfortunately over the years that when it's been sort of freely available, it's conditioned us to, to believe what they want us to believe. I mean, there's a whole section in the book about that as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And an example of, of what's happened in the last uh, week or 10 days um, following the event that happened with the MP Joe Cox and the hoo-ha that's going on there, there seems to be, uh, there's a fund being set up uh, in her memory and uh, one of the major beneficiaries of that fund is the White Helmets. Now, we're all told in the press, uh, particularly the BBC, that these White Helmets are marvellous knights in shining armour that are going in to help the people of Syria, whereas um, the reality is far from that. You know, we've, um, we've had Eva Bartlett on this show, and she's been out there to Syria and to Gaza, and she said these white helmets, they are simply aiding the terrorists, and they're, they're an NGO funded, yeah. uh, as far as I'm aware, by the British government, and yeah. uh, they're really not doing what we're told they're doing, so... You know, surely that that is something that should alert people that there's something not altogether savoury about what's going on there. Well, absolutely, but people, you know, even if even if you actually grabbed somebody by the throat and sat them down in front of a, uh, you know, something that that proved that that was what was happening, they, they still wouldn't believe it <laughs> because they're so they're so inured in this culture that we have this this um, you know that that. You know, our government tells us the truth. Television tells us the truth. We're, we're you know, we're, we're so far down that road that it's so difficult to actually change people's minds or to get people to, uh, you know, to, to think outside the box. Exactly. I, I, so I've been in Manchester this afternoon, and everywhere I went, I've been accosted by people saying, "Are you going to vote Remain? Are you going to vote Remain?" Nobody for Brexit at all campaigning on the streets. Mm. You know, but the point I was making is that I, I 
I, did, I couldn't be bothered, to be honest. I was going to, at one point, stop and just chat to them and say, you know, what on earth? How on earth can you even begin to justify staying in the EU? You know, what sort of a brain does anybody have who feels that it's beneficial to the British people to stay in that? I, I mean, I, it just beggars belief to me. But then when you think about it more deeply, you realise that it's because people are just brainwashed. They, 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 they latch upon somebody's opinion or they hear it over and over and over again on the TV and then it suddenly becomes their opinion. And they, and they can't see past that then. It, it's a strange phenomenon, but no doubt some psycholog psychologists will be able to explain it. But I, I, I thought, well, it, it's just I'm just be wasting my time if I did that. But uh, well, exactly. Yeah. We we get on the mainstream news. We get so many things that that when you take you stand back and take a real look at them, they're, they're completely ridiculous. Um, I suppose a good example would be aluminium aeroplanes um, vanishing inside. <laughs> concrete and steel buildings but you just can't tell some people that that's not physically possible no. and the fact that they can't fly at 550 mile an hour at that altitude that you know rip the wings off blah de blah de blah yeah. no uh, no trained military or air, airline pilot could ever fly the maneuvers of the planes that supposedly mm. flow into those towers but people just believe it because it's in the tv and then you've yeah. got celebrities like um, Bob, as in Poop, Geldof, telling <laughs> people that, you know, this is the way you should vote and screw mm -hmm. you, fishermen. And then you've got the likes of Bonio, who I thought was quite a cool dude till he disappeared up his own backside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it appears he's um, committing massive fraud with his foundation. And, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he'd be interested in suing us, but then he'd have to prove that he's telling the truth. So uh, not got no worries there. But they've mm. just got an interesting snippet posted in the chat room by Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. And he says that according to Richie Allen, would you believe the presiding judge in the case of the murder of Joe Cox is the same one who oversaw the Lee Rigby trial and the judge that ordered Lord Gravel Channer was unfit to face trial on charges of sexually abusing children. Well, that's very interesting, actually. Yeah, thanks for that, whoever wrote that. But, yeah, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest, obviously. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd like a little bit of clar clarification of which Lee Rigby trial. Um, are, are we talking about the murder trial or are we talking about um, Chris Spivey's... Uh, uh, he had a trial didn't he, for um, harassment. I don't know, so I'd like I'd like to know which trial it was. But yeah, that it, it is really, it it is really telling and revealing. Yeah. Mm. I, yep. I suspect he means the uh, the trial of the two alleged assailants rather than Chris Spivey. I'm guessing. I don't think uh, I don't think uh, it would be Chris. I might be wrong, but uh, my first instinct would be to say the. Uh, how is Chris anyway? I know you you uh, you write some articles for his website, don't you? Yeah, uh, he's not he's not been too good at that thing, but it's all right. Fair enough. He's um he's, he's got really bad arthritis at the moment. Um, I hope you don't mind me telling you that. But uh, it, yeah, he's um he's okay. And I think under the circumstances, what he's having to put up with, you know, the harassment and everything, and it, I think he's a little bit down in the dumps from time to time. But it it, it he's a good man. He keeps on, you know, keeps on keeping on. Mm. Yeah, he is a good man. We had, we, we had him on not long after he, um, on, on this show on Raconteurs News, not long after we'd had you on, um, actually. Right. So right. Uh, I think we'll probably give him a call up and see if he wants to uh, get himself back on and uh, tell us tell us about what's uh, what's been going on in his life. But yeah, I'm sure he I, would, I was interested in what you were talking about um, earlier on um, when you said that you were in Manchester today mm. and you got three or four people approaching you Asking you if you're going to vote Remain. Yeah, it was more than that, actually. I bet it was about eight. Um, right, so you've got eight people who voting. Um, th now, this, it, psychologically, to me, that seems like it's it's r repetition, which is a, a, a neuro-linguistic programming um, yeah. Yeah. technique. So yeah. if you... Because I, I would have thought that... In fact, I, think, I, I, I do believe it, that you're not allowed to campaign on, on the actual election day. Is, is that right? I don't know that. I've not heard that, to be honest, Jason. Um, well, interesting, well, the BBC, if so. 
I was listening to the BBC Five Live this morning, and they said that there were there was they, they there is no campaigning on the, on the actual day of the vote, um, which is the reason why they didn't have on anybody on who was either pro or mm. or uh, anti. Remain. Well, they should have told that in that case they should have told the people or the groups of people that were around thrusting leaflets in people's face, telling them to vote Remain. Yeah, yeah. I think that's been that, that's been uh, that's that's pretty much been the remain camps tactics and it? it it's all been mm. underhand what 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 did you make of of uh, the the murder of um the the, the labor mp and it's remain well, campaigner no cops obviously there's no definitive answer to that but my my own as soon as it happened i thought hello very very strange very 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 fishy and it was only like about probably about the following day when it occurred to me, I'm sure this sounds familiar. And it was like uh, about 13 years ago, was it in Sweden? A lady Lind. by the name of Anna Lind, yeah. who was a Swedish MP who was voting for, um, was it to stay or, or, or to put she Sweden into the Euro? To, to adopt the Euro. Yes. She was campaigning right. for, to, to adopt the Euro, which, yeah. and then she was murdered a, a week before the election. Yeah, in very similar circumstances, and uh, she and was she was a woman of a similar age, young woman. I think they do that to generate most sympathy for the mm. cause. Uh, you know, because you know, it's not if it had been an old guy, you know, like a sort of a seventy-year-old decrepit old MP, it wouldn't have had the same effect, would it? But a young woman with a young family, you know, I mean, it also begs the question: Is she even dead? Mm. In the reaction of the family afterwards would say to me, no, I don't think she is, actually, because what was the first thing that her husband said on the same day that she was killed? This is a new beginning for us. What the hell does that mean? You know, if that had been my wife that had been, been brutally murdered in the street, I wouldn't have wanted to talk to anybody. I'd have said, just leave me alone. I want to grieve in peace. But he comes out with this fantastic, what appeared to me like a scripted statement about it all being a new beginning and... And there didn't seem to be any grief in there at all. It was just, it was just bizarre. So I, I just found it all very suspicious. I suppose is the answer to your question, but I can't really, you know, definitively come up with an answer. No, John, I, I haven't seen the uh, whatever it was that her husband said, but I have seen the uh, um, the footage of a sister reading out a statement with the family behind her, and. For someone whose immediate family member had just been murdered, there was an awful lot of smiles being going on between them. And they, yeah, I, I, you know. It, I, I, it, also, um, just a little side note on the murder of Anna Lind. She she was actually yeah. murdered on September the eleventh, two thousand and three. Right, I so, wish she, I didn't so, know. That, yeah, it's a date that does seem to be very popular with these yeah. uh, scumbags, yeah. doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. They love the numerology, don't they? But uh, that's another story altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, Curtis's birthdays. What? Sorry. It, I said it's probably one of one of the they. It's probably one of their birthdays, and that it's as simple as that. That that's, that, <laughs> that's the reason why the date is is, is used. Well, who knows? it's it, it definitely is used very often. Yeah. Mm. Well, it has been suggested by a lot of people, and I've seen people claiming that it's absolute cast iron fact that it was actually Jesus's birthday. Um, I mean, we're told that he was born on December the 25th, when it appears that he was actually born in the summertime. Um, but December the 25th is an old pagan holiday, as is right. Easter, Ishtar. Yeah, well, it's also to do with um, uh, the the. The solstice, isn't it? And uh, and that's why they say that Jesus was he died and then was resurrected on the third day. Well, the, the 25th of December is the third day after the, sol the winter, sol winter solstice. From the mm. Yeah, so it's it's all connected with that as well. So yeah, well that that story of died on the cross, uh, sorry, born of a virgin, died on the cross, rose again after three days. That that is mm. in so many ancient religions. They all yeah. just seem to be rehashing the same old story. And That's from right. what I can gather, it's based on astrotheology. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what happens in the sky. It's nothing to do with any real per people that may or may not have done any certain things on those days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
And of but course, I... if uh, if Jesus was born on September the 11th, he was uh, a Virgo, and he was born of, of a virgin. So that makes sense as well, doesn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, not not thought about that, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> good one. Yeah, good find there, Jason. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we've got this. We've got this. Uh, this MP who's involved in the Remain campaign, and, and like you said, we've got a lot of um, similarities between her and Anna Lind. Um, mm. and, and what's particularly interesting is that they've always got young children, haven't they? They've always yes. got young children. Um, Just to that... maximise the sympathy, isn't it? You know. Oh, the poor woman. You know. Oh, poor thing. Those poor children. How could anybody? How could anybody do such a thing? Terrible, awful. Mm. I won't vote to stay in now. Oh, no, sod that. Yeah, well, it, uh, it's like so many of these stories that that don't quite appear to be what we're first told. And as you start seeing the reporting unfold, it, I mean, it, it's quite a common thing now that. Um, we obviously don't need police anymore because the, the BBC are able to solve any crime and know all about it within milliseconds of it actually taking place. Absolutely, so, yeah. um, you know, they give you uh, chapter and verse five minutes after it's happened, don't they? they yeah. Just believe well, that so and so is responsible. Yeah. Ex exactly. And I wonder, you know, are they going to slip up again and make another mistake like the. Um, the destruction of Building 7, which was actually reported about 27 minutes before it actually took place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody read the script too early, didn't they? That was the problem. <laughs> yes, that was Jane Stanley. And, it was. Uh, removed from the BBC's website, and they actually said that it never actually happened. But there's yeah. enough people out there who've got video captures of it, and uh, it's all over YouTube, and I think the cat's well and truly out of the bag on that one. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we should perhaps change the roles of different organisations. The BBC could become the new police, um, and the police could then perhaps, you know, show us EastEnders and, and some drama on, on TV, because it took the BBC two, ten, fifteen minutes to 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 solve every major crime, shoot, false flag shooting, and, and all that sort of thing. But yeah. it took the police two years to find out that Cliff Richard had not been bumming children. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, very good. You see, so if, if we if we switch it around, the BBC is obviously they they solve crimes. Yeah. Do you think well, anybody would actually notice though, Jess? Sorry. Do you think anybody would actually notice if we did swap them around? They probably wouldn't. Well, well it, it appears that you're watching what, EastEnders, one. Yeah, it appears that rather than journalism nowadays, um, these people are just copy and pasters of um, police press statements. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and if you look at if you look at the Orlando shooter, he that is Kyle Walker, England, the right back for England at the moment. Just have a look at the image of um, Omar Martini's name, isn't it? The the yes. uh, alleged Orlando shooter. If you if you look at an image of him, he looks exactly the same as Kyle Walker, um, right back for England at the moment. <laughs> they have just picked a, a plucked a photograph off the internet. Oh, he'll do. We'll, we'll have him <laughs> and just happen to be Kyle Walker. <laughs> well, nobody in America is going to know who Kyle Walker is, are they? I mean, well, they're, just, true, yeah. they're going to think, well, who's going to know this guy? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's you, you, interesting there. You raised about um, Kitty uh, not being or not having enough evidence to, to secure a conviction. Um, but that news actually broke the day of um, the Joe Cox incident. So it, that just reminded me when I realised that the two things had happened on the same day and uh, Cliff not being a bum bandit didn't get any reporting. I thought, ah, I remember a memo that went out on September the 11th, 2001, that said, this is a good day to bury bad news. Absolutely, yeah. Again, perception management, that's what it's all about. Everything's all, all about perception management. And, and, and perception is everything. If you, if you look at people, how, how people react and respond to other people online, you can see that that's because their perception of that other group of people has been, has been skewed and it's been yeah. manipulated. Yeah. 
Mm. Which is why we're in we're in um, such deep doo doo, I think. Anyway. Well, and yeah. also with this issue issue of perceptive people, excuse me, perception management. I mean that kind of relates to to John's book really because um, there's enough people out there telling the world and anyone who will listen that uh, the whole banking system is a fraud, it's a means of enslavement, it's been going on for thousands of years, um, yet, the, you know, if you're watching a BBC, the, the banks are so marvellous, we couldn't possibly survive without them, mm. um, and anyone who challenges them is a uh, freeman on the land. I mean, we, we've got friends who, who come on the show occasionally, um, such like as Kevin Mark and Paul Webster, who were challenging the utility companies in court um, because all commerce is done internationally and nationally on the bills of exchange. Now, um, when you're sent a utility bill, if you get sent a bill rather than pay by direct debit, what they actually do is they send you a cheque with your name on it and an amount in figures. But then they trick you into going into the bank or the post office and paying it again. Mm. Now, what these guys are doing is saying, well, no, under the bills of exchange, this is a check in my name. I, I tried doing that years ago without half a clue about the bills of exchange. But I thought, hang on. It used to say bank gyro check on the bottom, right. which they call a paying in slip. And I went into the bank, I went into the post office and tried to cash it in both places and they wouldn't have it. And I thought, oh, well, maybe maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree. But it appears kind of 20 or 30 years before I found out the truth about the matter, I, I kind of sussed it. Mm. Um, but you try and tell people about the fact that the, the, these bills are already paid and under a non-commercial agreement you're not liable it's only corporations that are liable to pay for these things but they come back at you with things as ridiculous as well my gas bill goes up because you don't pay yours and <laughs> you, know, yeah. even, you can demonstrate them factually in law the bill is already paid yeah yeah but i know um, but it, it's it, but it, the problem with that is even if you even if you went to court over it, you still lose because the court is biased in favour of the corporations. Um, and and the, and the I, I'm, I'm sure some of the very senior judges know what the truth is, but I, I don't know. I, I tend to think that some of the lesser, lesser lights in the legal system are just as clueless as us about it. Yeah, well, I know several people who've, who've been to court and rather than let them have the victory which would make case law and it would bring the whole pack of cards tumbling down. They they just yeah. railroad um, the individuals who, who've got the nows to take it to court. So, yeah, the, the court system is controlled. Um, it's not there for the our same benefit. People. You know, it's the Crown, isn't it? And yeah. The, the yeah. people don't realise the Crown is not part of the UK. It's a separate, com it's a separate country. Yeah. Oh, no, you were right first time. It's a separate company. <laughs> company, country, same difference. They're all corporations, aren't they? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And the Crown Corporation of the City of the Lon City of London uh, seems to be at, at behind everything you see going on. Yeah, again, that is covered in the book. You know, I go into great detail about the uh, the, the the City of London and you know how. Everything is what that you believe is a public institution is actually a corporation, um, you know. So that's all in there too. Um, I'm sure it's from that sort of stuff is familiar to a lot of people, so I won't go into any detail on it. But uh, you know, it's a fact. It's an inescapable fact. But you'd never. I don't believe that you'd ever win if you went to court to contest that, because mm. as, as as we just pointed out, you know, the courts are bent. Uh, you know, as bent as the people who are. Uh, committing a scam on us, you know. So. Something I'd like to ask, John, is did mm -hmm. you find any connection in your investigations between the banking industry and Freemasonry? Well, only in as much as that there's <laughs> the Freemasonry is connected to everything of that ilk. Um, yeah, I mean, nothing that I could specifically hang my hat on and say, 
yes, that you know, the, obviously the people at the top are all Freemasons, but then you could apply that to any institution. You know, most of them, ninety nine percent of them, are, are Freemasons, and not just Freemasons, but thirty second or thirty third degree Freemasons, which, for those who don't know, those are the top two degrees, and those are the people who basically run the world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it. I've not found a specific link in terms of, you know, yes, it's it's specifically the banky people, the bank, the banksters, as I call them, that are uh, linked to Freemasonry, because I think the whole shooting matches. I mean, have you got any sort of thoughts on that? What, my thoughts, particularly, are that um, they may not be an obvious direct connection but it does seem that that whatever we seem to look into freemasonry is almost like the glue that binds it all together yeah absolutely yeah that's and, right and but as i say it's not just banking it's the whole thing it's yeah the whole shooting yeah. match yeah if you've got you know the bankers are obviously in cahoots with the judges who are in cahoots with the councils who I mean, there must be some kind of a common link because you, you can't say, well, all the judges and all the councillors and all the bankers all went to the same yeah. school together or they, yeah. they all drink in the same pub. It wouldn't be physically yeah. possible. But yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, well, I'm not wondering, I, I'm firmly convinced that that is the glue that binds it all together and yeah. allows all these yeah. disparate elements to work so seamlessly together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, another book that I'd recommend for anybody who's, who's interested in looking at that Freemasonry connection is, is uh, The Brotherhood. Uh, oh, gosh, who wrote it now? Stephen. Oh, um, Stephen. Oh, what was his name? Stephen, Stephen oh, something. I can't remember. I, but yeah, I, Stephen somebody. <laughs> I read it many years ago. Yeah, it's an yeah. excellent book. It's, uh, it's worth another read if you get hold of a copy. I've, I've still got my copy. It's very bat- battered and doggy. But, I mean, the poor guy was... Was murdered shortly after that, you know. I don't know whether you're aware of that. No, I you know, wasn't. By, by the usual modus operandi, which is poison. Ah, That's got it. Favorite assass- assassination method. It's um, available. So- it's available on Amazon.co.uk for four pounds seventy not seventy four Kindle. There's a hardcover version for a penny, but I bet that's got about a ten of postage on it. Or it's on paperbook for nine. Paperback for nine ninety nine with Prime delivery. So and who was it, Stephen? Stephen Knight. That's I should him. have remembered yeah. that because I'd got a friend at the time I read it called Steve Knight. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, then Stephen Knight was also involved in the uh, the business re uh, Jack the Ripper, uh, the real identity of Jack the Ripper coming to light in the in the 1970s he was he was intrinsically involved in that although I don't know quite what his motivation was but he seemed to think that it wasn't uh the person that the, the evidence seemed to point at but that's an, that's another story probably for another time but uh, but yeah Stephen Knight's book just absolutely lays bare what what goes on in Freemasonry and uh, it, as I say it's well worth a read mm. I'm not on commission for it by the way but no, absolutely, we're not either, and uh, I don't particularly like promoting Amazon, but it is a good way of finding books that are sometimes quite hard to get hold of in bookshops. Um, sure. I, it, for anyone who is listening but not actually in the chat room, um, if you go to our website, com and uh, go to the live stroke chat room page, you can actually listen from there. And also, I have posted the link to John's book and to Stephen Knight's book, The Brotherhood, in there. Yeah, cheers, Andy. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Jeff's just corrected me. It's not a tenner postage. It's two pound eighty post and packaging for the hardback. So that's not so bad. Two pound eighty one p. You can have a hardback book. That's pretty good. Probably second hand and a bit dog eared, but well yeah. worth having. Yeah. Best ones. That's one. Definitely the best ones. Well, I think it's about uh, an hour now. We've been on. We, the first hour's gone like mad, hasn't it? It's gone. It's just flown by. 
Yeah, it um, always does, doesn't it? So <laughs> around about this time, we play a tune. We've got a tune lined up, Andy. We'll play a tune. We'll go and have a bit of a comfort break. Uh, just to remind you, you're listening to Raconteurs News uh, on raconteursnews.com this Thursday night, and it's uh, well, it's one minute past eight. Al, it's not the, it's not one minute past the top of the hour. It's one minute past eight. Fabulous, Jason. And we've got uh, Doc Rock coming up at nine o'clock, and I think we're just going to take a, a quick record and uh, a bit of a comfort break. Yeah, what what a I've lined up. I thought um, when we were talking about banksters, I couldn't find any particular songs about banksters, but I remembered a a video I watched recently online called "All Wars Are Bankers Wars." So uh, let's have one of Keno's more recent hits, "War." <laughs> Terminal disease and die young. And, above all else, 
Don't mention the war! Right, this is Colin Johnson from East Coast Resistance, and you're listening to Raconteur's News. And welcome back to Raconteur's News, this wonderful, uh, rainy, midsummer's Thursday evening. Um, me and Jason, as usual, and this evening we're joined by John Hamer. Welcome back, John. Hi, thanks. And um, so we kind of covered a basic outline of your book, but um, perhaps you'd like to uh, give us a little bit more detail, obviously without spoiling it for anyone. Oh, yeah, minutes. sure. I mean, the, the problem that I have is there's so much, so much in there. It's it's difficult to know where to. I mean, there's a lot of generalisation in there. You know, talking about things like the war of terror as opposed to the war on terror. But there's also you know a fair few specifics in there. You know, such as the um, the, the JFK assassination, um, the, uh, the 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 moon landings hoax, and. Uh, the fact that Yuri Gagarin, for example, you know, the, the alleged first man in space was part of a deal that was brokered between America and Russia to allow America to claim the first moon landings, mm-hmm. combined with the Bay of Pigs as well, so that it wasn't um, it wasn't too too much of a disparity between claiming credit for the moon landings and claiming credit for the first man in space. The Americans took the Bay of Pigs in there as well, because Kennedy actually negotiated that he would uh, he would not not uh, Sanction the Bear Pigs invasion, so it was just done behind his back anyway. Wasn't the first man in space uh, uh, Vladimir Ilushin? It, it was meant to be Vladimir Ilushin, but it, whether it was actually him or not, I mean, the one that the, the say it was was Yuri Gagarin, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a there's a really good film that I'd recommend anybody watches. It's um, just if you look online, it's. Uh, I can't remember its name, but it is Vladimir. If you search Vladimir Ilushin, he was a, a space pilot and he was um, a pioneer of the Ilushin Airlines, yeah. um, the aeroplanes. And so he was, and he allegedly was the first man in space. But the mission went wrong, and he land, actually landed in China. And at that time, China and Russia were at loggerheads, and they kept Ilushin. Um, in hospital because uh, he was oh, quite yeah. injured uh, for, for a number of months. It's a re- really good, interesting um, documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, like I said, a couple of little bits of that, not specifically that, but about Gagarin and how that was a was a was a hoax and and as I say, how, how it was like. Because a lot of people, what kicked me off on that tack was a lot of people used to say to me when I used to talk about the moon landing hoax. Yeah, but the Russians would never have gone along with it. And I used to think, hmm, yeah, interesting. Now, why would the Russians go along with it? And the reason that I found that the Russians went along with it was because they'd already been given the little, the minor prize of being being allowed to say that they had the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, who actually never went to space at all. And uh, but as I was, sort of was saying before, the the Americans, or more specifically JFK said that as part of the deal, he wouldn't sanction the Bay of Pigs invasion. But as I said, that that didn't happen anyway. They just went behind his back anyway and, and went ahead with that. But for some reasons, the Russians still stuck to their part of the bargain and didn't question the uh, the big moon landing hoax, which was obviously out of the three of them. That was the real biggie. So, yeah. Um, it's so easy to prove that Gagarin never went into space, you know, with the interviews that I had afterwards. I've seen one or two with translations, uh, assuming that the translations are genuine. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, he, he made all sorts of errors. You know, he said he was wearing the wrong kind of colour clothing. He said that there were no... No, he said he saw South America out of portholes in this spaceship, and apparently the ship didn't have any portholes. They asked him if he got... <laughs> you know, how many good pictures it taken, and he said, well, we didn't even have a camera. And he just looked completely dumbfounded at this in- interview, as if you picked somebody off the street and said, right, there's going to be a load of guys asking you some questions, you know, about, you know, we've told them that you're the first man into space, right? So go in that room and just answer a few questions, just make it up as you go along, basically. We don't give a stuff. And it's just as though that had happened, because he's, he's just clueless. And it's so obvious that, you know, what he's saying is untrue. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that, but that's just a, a brief synopsis of it, yeah. Yeah, and also with the the, char- 
what seems to be obvious collaboration between America and Russia over the lies that were told to us about their various space programs. Yeah. Um, that's they've got to bring you towards the Cold War, which, uh, is, as far as I've been able to ascertain, was completely bogus as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it was just, it was just, I mean, it was like what we, what we have now, the war on terror. Seems to have got a little bit of feedback. I don't know how that's coming through, but are you okay? With, can you hear me okay? okay now. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've lost, the, lost my thread now. What was saying? Yeah, um, the the uh, the Cold War was just basically the uh, the war on on terror of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Basically, it was just their way of, of keeping everybody in fear and trepidation, and uh, obviously a few fearful. People are more easily controlled. So when when the Cold War ended in the early 1990s and the Berlin, Berlin Wall came down and all that, they had to come up with something new to keep us all in fear and trepidation. And uh, obviously, the the war on terror was, and you know, the, all these evil Muslim terrorists was the answer. Mm -hmm. I, well, I I remember back from my school days in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, it the way the Cold War was put towards you, it, we were quite convinced a lot of the time that um, any minute now yeah, there'd be a, an atom yeah. drop and we'd all have to hide under our desks. Which that's right. Yeah. That, that would have saved your life, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Duck and cover. Yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> and and then when it seemed that that was wearing a bit thin, suddenly AIDS came along and that put. Fear of God into uh, anybody who was spreading their love a bit too generously. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, I believe you, you've got um, a chapter in your book called "The War of Terror." The War of Terror, yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, what, 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 what's that? I'm getting the feedback again, guys. Can you? Does it sound bad at your end? It's like I've got an echo in all the time I'm talking. Now it's gone again. Now, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, the war on the war of terror. Now it's come back. The war of terror. Sorry about this. Yeah, sorry, John. It's just Skype. It does that from time to time. Yeah, it's yeah. been behaving Is it coming itself. through your end? Or? No, it's sounding pretty good. There's okay. a slight echo, but it's... I'll, I'll try and ignore it then. If you could. Um, yeah, I've got a chapter called The War of Terror which is obviously the plain words of the war on terror. And basically what I'm saying is exactly what we just alluded to, and the fact that, that the war on terror was, was created artificially as, the, you know, the next um, fear and, uh, and, and trepidation uh, uh, chapter in our lives, if you like. So basically what they're doing, they're scaring us to death with the threat of terrorism. You know, that every time we go on a plane, we might be bombed out of the sky. You know, if we go into a shopping mall, there's a danger of, you know, explosions. Um, so, you know, really just expanding on that theme an awful lot. Uh, it, it's, it's just complete nonsense. You know, the, the facts and figures that, that you get about terrorism, you know, it's something like six people been killed in, in the United States in the last five years in terrorist attacks. Six people in, in, you know, and even that's debatable, I guess, you know, because what they call terrorist attacks and what are really terrorist attacks are probably completely different. You know, compare that to the three quarters of a million that die every year as a as a result of, um, you know, hospital or doctor errors. You know, where's the war on hospital errors? You know, 750,000 people a year as opposed to six people in five years. And yet the anti-terrorism budget is about... Fifty times greater than the, uh, you know, the, than the than the medical budget, you know. So it, it I just really go into detail about that. It, it, it's all nonsense, and it's all just there to make us basically live in fear because it's easier to control people. Yeah, fear is a great control weapon. I mean, uh, you see it being used all over the place, but. Um, if we're not in fear of these psychopaths, they really lost the control over us. So what I do uh, yeah. everyone Absolutely. to do is get informed, lose the fear, and you know, Absolutely, yeah. challenge it head on. Yeah. 
And what I, I also sort of make allusions to, uh, again, another book that I would recommend people read, and, I'm, and I promise you I'm not on commission, <laughs> is 1984 by George Orwell. You know, a lot, it's a very popular book, very common book. Um, and but a lot of people have never have not read it, and people should read it because it's an absolute blueprint for what is happening today. It's exactly what is happening today. Yeah. Coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences, you know. But that's that's just the way it is. Um, it, it's absolutely staggering. I, I, I read it about twenty years ago. I read it at school originally, then I read it about twenty years ago, and then I read it again last year, and. and, and it, it was just incredible the the similarities between what's going on in the world today and what happens in 1984. Yeah, so I can hear you're getting a bit of an echo there, John. But uh, yeah. Tony's just posted in the chat room that the echo's not coming through on air. So okay, we're doing. Right. I mean, 1984. I, I'd absolutely agree with you there. I mean, it was probably one of the most important books I ever read, if not the most important. I read it about the age of 12 or 13, and then I read it again when I was 16 at the encouragement of my English teacher at school. And it was yeah. probably the only worthwhile book I ever actually read while I was at school. There was a lot of Shakespeare and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes, there is some interesting stuff in Shakespeare, but when you start pulling it apart, it, it, it's another way of, of steering people, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, and, and, then you'd start looking into who was William Shakespeare. Mm. Was it actually somebody else, or was it a group of people, or you know? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I'd say one of my contacts, I would say, is the greatest world authority on who wrote Shakespeare. He is he is, is more or less devoted his whole life to to looking into that situation, and it. I couldn't begin to explain it the way that he does, but it's absolutely fascinating. And, and I, I, you should have him on, actually, because he's a Canadian guy called uh, Tim Watson. His pen name is Tim Spearman, mm -hmm. Shakespeare Spearman. Um, but I'll tell you, it's is, is, uh, is, is fascinating. And to listen to how he has come to the conclusions he has about, about who wrote Shakespeare and what it was really all about and what it relates to, it's brilliant, absolutely amazing. That's a so, great idea, John. That would uh, would give me uh, the opportunity to try and look intelligent and quote Shakespeare because I can actually <laughs> I can actually remember a few of the speeches because yeah I, I was one of those people at school I was very lucky and I had a, a very retentive memory so I could learn speeches and poetry and all that stuff and I could get the gist of a book by flicking through it so I managed to uh, pass all my O levels by just remembering stuff i mean that um, you know most of my o levels 60 percent of the marks were on what was it the julius caesar the book and i was a borderline f grade when we went into the exam because 40 percent was on coursework and uh, those sorry it was 60 percent coursework borderline fail and i did the exam having never read the book and came out with a grade b so right. i must have done fairly well on that yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so we'll love a bit of Shakespeare, don't we? Though we're a, a, a nice Shakespeare quote, you know, like "I have a dream." Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually amazing how many Shakespeare quotes we use in real life without actually realizing, you know, realizing that they're from Shakespeare. It's just literally hundreds. The English language is just full of them, mm. whether that's by design or by just by the. You know, sheer brilliance of the of the English. Because I mean, whoever wrote the damn thing, you've got to admit that you know it, it's beautiful. The language is absolutely stunning, even though you don't you know you don't necessarily understand a lot of it at face value because it's 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 different. It's not what we're used to. But when you see it in the context of the play, when you actually go and sit in the theatre and watch the play, it all becomes a sort of it all fits in. You understand it, and it's just so well, it, it's stunning, really. Hmm. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, so whoever wrote it, I mean, it's just uh, it's just an amazing uh, body speaking, of work. Speaking of which, um, uh, speaking of writing, you know, when you were uh, when you began writing this book, did you have a, a single firm vision of what you wanted to write, or did it did you sort of like have an idea of what you wanted to write, and then you started going down sort of all different tangents, and hence yeah. it's it's ended up being part one, and it's eleven hundred pages. Yeah, I wrote, 
Yeah, yeah, the latter, really. I, I just started writing. I, I know people, people sometimes think I'm crazy when I say so, but maybe I am. But um, I, when I'm writing, it's almost like I've completely, my brain is switched off. And I just go into sort of automatic mode. It's like I'm, you know, you, you hear all this stuff about automatic writing and that. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't go that far. It's not like I believe that somebody up there is, is writing it through me or anything like that. But sometimes I write a piece, you know, just a paragraph. I think, where the hell did that come from? I know, I just, I, I can barely believe that I wrote it. I know it's a really weird thing and it probably sounds crazy, but, um, but yeah, I, 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 I just tend to write, and it, and it just fly, it flows out my fingers. And then when I've written it, I start to uh, think, right, well, 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 where will that bit go? How will, you know, how does that fit into the big jigsaw? Think of it like as a, as a jigsaw puzzle, I do, and I, and I try and sort of put each little piece in place. Um, and then that, you know, when I've written that bit, I think, ah, yeah, well, that's connected to that. So that goes there, and I'll and I'll write that bit there as well because that that is intrinsically connected to that, and it gets extremely complex after a while. But you, you know, you and again, when I actually come to editing the book and sorting it out into some semblance of of proper order, you know, that seems to come naturally as well through some strange. I, I don't know. Uh, again, I don't want to come across like a a, lo a loony or something, but it is. Um, it's almost as I'm being guided by by some sort of outside force. I can't put it any more, um, you know, plainly than that, really. And, and the sad thing is, is that is that you felt a little bit reticent about saying something like that when that that's perfectly to to people like myself and Andy. That's, yeah. that's perfectly acceptable and and perfectly, yeah. you know, perfectly yeah. reasonable answer. Absolutely, I know what you're saying. Yeah, well, yeah, it is because we can, again we're conditioned to to think that that is that's crazy. That, yeah, that could never happen in real life. That's just, that's just, uh, you know, uh, you know, weirdos that, that believe things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know, and uh, sort of regret saying it now, but <laughs> I, know, I know what you mean. No, absolutely not, John. I mean, crazy is the new normal in my life, anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I've I've spoke to through the process of doing this show and the other ones that I've done and. Uh, just talking up with people, I've spoke to writers, musicians, and artists, and an awful lot of them seem to say, "Well, it didn't come from me; it came through me. I just yeah. wrote yeah. it down, or, or I just, you know, the tune flowed out of my fingertips, or, you know, I, I, the, yeah. I just got some paint, and that's what happened." Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I talk about sportsmen being in the zone. Well, it's mm. like the sort of literally literary equivalent of being in the zone you know you just you, and yet some days it doesn't happen at all i've sat at my laptop many a day and thought right well i'll finish that bit now and i just sit there and i, I type a few words and I think oh, that's not right that's not good and I'll, I'll i'll delete it all and start again no 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 and then i'll, I'll, I'll sod it i'll go and have my lunch again <laughs> i'm not i'm not on it today at all you know so it, it is very much like that um Oh, we've got um, Tony who do, does great work for us at RN. He, uh, he sorted our website out for us. He's uh, working together with Jimmy and Nick on the new solution for broadcasting. He mm -hmm. says, same here. He's not in control. So does that mean you're out of control, Tony? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Tony. We love Tony. He's, 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 he's not in out. control, no. If, 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 if there's somebody else in control of him, then... Uh, we love them too. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... yeah. No, it is interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, 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 you know, even the titles of my books, I don't know where they came from either. You know, I sort of know where "Behind the Curtain" came from because that was a that was a quote from the Jerome Daly case that you were talking about while I was briefly uh, otherwise engaged. Um, the judge said. When uh, when when a, a, another case came to court similar to Daly's, where he was trying to get his mortgage annulled for the same reasons as Daly, the judge actually said, "We, we can't do that. We're not going there. We're not going behind that curtain." And so uh, that's where I got it from, behind the curtain. Um, but again, I, I, it just like it, it sort of popped into my brain, and I thought, "Yeah, that's perfect. You know, that's a perfect title for the book." 
that is a curious phrase because when you look at the, the Wizard of Oz, it seems that was written yes. to tell us all about the banking industry. But I'm sure yeah. one of the people that, if not more, that have come on to the show talking about the challenges to the legal system have actually said they've had the same phrase from a judge. We're not going behind that curtain. Really? Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if that's some kind of secret Masonic language. or It could be. Yeah. Mm. It wouldn't surprise me, mate, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah. So perhaps that will ring a lot of bells with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were, uh, yeah, I mean, have you, I know you've just finished this book and it took you quite a while. Um, are you taking a rest now or are you straight into something else, John? I'm just having a brief sabbatical um, mm. through the summer and then I'm going to start. When the dark nights start closing in, in about July, <laughs> no, in about <laughs> uh, you know the end of September, early October, I'm I'm going to start on something else. I've already got it sort of outlined in my head what I'm going to do, and again, you know, it's just sort of slowly taking shape. I think about it from time to time as I'm as I'm going along, and uh, I thought, what about doing a a companion volume to the falsification of history and calling it the falsification of science? Because those two things seem to me the, the 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 main you know way that we're controlled you know through through lying about history and through lying about science and I thought that's perfect it's, you know there's perfect synergy there between those two things. That sounds brilliant. I'm really looking forward to hearing about that book, John. Because um, yeah, yeah, uh, you know I I was quite scientifically minded. I was kind of really wrapped up in science when I was younger. Mm. Um, a lot of it, physics, a little bit of chemistry, not so big on the biology. But as I've got older and I've started digging deeper, I just find out that so much of what we're taught just doesn't make any sense. Mm. You know, and, and you can no. pull holes in it. I mean, yeah. a, a classic example, we, we were talking to uh, an engineer who's found a, a marvellous solution to help people feel better to be healthier to um, remedy all sorts of maladies with the body mm. and it, it was all about the he, he picked up a biology textbook that was talking about how trees get uh, water from their roots up to their leaves and there were various different explanations in there he, he, de he debunked all of them and uh, he, he's worked on it until he's he found out how it actually works, and then he's applied that that new science to um, the human body. And uh, you know, people are saying, "Well, what shall I prop your head on?" And I love his answer: medical books, because they all need to be rewritten now. They're all rather rubbish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. well, again, it's, it, it's down to. Sorry, Sorry I, I was just going to. I was just going to say. Your new, your, when you're talking about your new book, uh, the false uh, falsification of science. Mm. Um, there's, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a very, very interesting um, uh, talk by a guy called uh, Rupert Sheldrake. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and he does a. It's, I think it's on. Uh, if you if you go on YouTube and you go on Banned TED Talks. Mm -hmm. Um, and he talks about science and the way that it's become dogmatic and yes. how he got a, a huge hole in it um, when he discovered that the speed of light had changed over a number of years. Now, I've got my own um, theories on, on why that happened, but um, it, that's sort of an example of, of how science is dogmatic and yet you can cut holes in it, and then it, you know, it, it, it sort of gets banned. Have you, I'm sure you've come across Rupert Sheldrake's talk. I, I don't think I've seen that specific one, but I do know Rupert Sheldrake, yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, the, there's so many things. That I've already sort of, I've started, you know, as I do, I've started jotting down stuff. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just briefly go through one or two things. And if you want to talk about any of those, I'm quite happy to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, my number one thing, my number one controlling theory, because if you notice in science, there's a lot of theories. But these theories are all always 
regarded as absolute unquestionable facts. Mm. You know, the theory of, you know, the theory of evolution. Bollocks. It's absolute garbage. You only need to scratch the surface of that to see that evolution is just utter, utter nonsense. And the reason that they, they brought evolution in was because um, they wanted to discredit religion because, you know, the world was becoming a more technological place and, and, and they wanted to re replace the old-fashioned science of religion with this new science of, uh, of um, you know, man being created by, you know, coming from, uh, you know, single-celled animals, basically, over a period of time. But again, that, you know, that is the... The, the even more deeper aspect to that is the fact that they wanted people to think that life is nothing. You know, life is nothing special. Life is just, you know, you're born and you die and that's your lot, mate. Um, and uh, one way of doing that was to was to, was to invent evolution and, and, and discredit religion. Now, I'm, I don't believe in organised religion, don't get me wrong, um, but I cer I'm certainly a spiritual person person and i believe that there is a spiritual purpose to our lives but again i don't want to go into that at this point because i think that's going into too much detail but evolution the theory of evolution the, the big bang theory again mm. you know there are certain scientists who are non-mainstream who just absolutely poo poo the big bang theory they just say it's been that that's been derived again for a similar sort of reason it, it's to it's to keep us in control and again, without going into too much detail about that, because you know I don't want to get wrapped up in that. But and then there's like the the other the other mainstream theory that uh, dinosaurs were wiped out by a, a meteorite hitting the Earth. Now, if you ask if you ask people those went out on the streets, I guarantee you, in the Western world anyway, and ask people the you know what uh, how did the Earth come about? How did how did life begin? And they all say, oh, well, it was a big bang and blah blah blah. The planets formed and the you know, they started to circle around the sun, and the sun's cooled, and the planet's cooled, and then evolution took place, and uh, and uh, you know, x number of million years later, here we are. Absolute garbage. Mm. If you asked anybody how the dinosaurs died out, they'd say, oh well, the, a meteorite hit the Earth apparently about 65 million years ago, and uh, all the dust and was thrown up into the atmosphere, and there was a nuclear winter for about a thousand years, and of course the dinosaurs didn't survive. Garbage. If the dinosaurs didn't survive, why did the mammals survive? You know, it's it's all it's all you know sops for the masses basically. I mean, I don't even believe that dinosaurs ever existed. I know that sound, might might sound really freaky and uh, and and controversial, but I really don't. I really just think it's part of that same same old same old all this you know basically just controlling and dinosaurs were there to show us that the Earth is a lot older than we originally believed it was. Because there's so much evidence to say. I, I, I'm a big fan of a guy called Michael Crichton. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Michael Crichton, but he, mm -hmm. he, he not big fan, sorry, I'm a big, Michael Crichton was the guy who wrote uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe that Michael Crichton was, was part of the, uh, part of the master plan, if you like, to, to foist that idea of dinosaurs upon us. And I think that's why Jurassic Park was promoted so heavily. Because it, it if if you know in the, if you know the films, it within that evolution is covered massively. And uh, you, you know, it, it, it's really promoted the fact that there are lots of different kinds of dinosaurs and the DNA still exists and we can recreate them if you know if the technology ever comes around. I just feel that um, you know it's all it's all too tenuous and anybody who looks just scrapes beneath the surface even a tiny little bit i'm sure they, they'll, they'll agree with what i'm saying mm. have, have you come across peter plichter john who oh, sorry peter plichter i can't hear the last name mate sorry plichter p-l-i-c-h-t-a no i haven't no. Oh, right uh, well um, I was recommended to read one of his books a while back by a very good friend, and right. it's called God's Secret Formula, and right. it, it's quite a short book, only about 160 pages, but in it, right. it explains how Plichter, um, instead of specialising in one science, he learned all the different sciences, 
and uh, there were so many things that didn't ring true. He set about yeah. proving that, that yeah. it was complete bunkum. And yeah. um, he went to this particularly high up physicist and explained to him what he discovered. And the guy says, well, you've absolutely proved that modern physics is a complete pile of tosh. Yeah. But we can't go along with it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. now, I mean, I, I've read that book and it, it had some real light bulb moments for me, particularly when you, 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 you find out that the universe has got certain numbers that are consistent throughout everything. And yeah. um, also then you start looking at the prime number cross. You yeah. know, you start arranging numbers in a certain way, you get this prime number cross and all right. the prime numbers lie within this particular cross. And lo and behold, that the cross is on the top of the English crown. It's uh, the Maltese cross. It's, oh, right. it's used everywhere. Right, right, right. Why is that particular symbol so prevalent in these I'll call it answers on a postcard too. Yeah. So who was who was that? Peter Swinkter. <laughs> Very nearly Peter Plichter. I mean, I'm, right. Okay. He's a German, so I'm sure it's Peter Plichter. But yeah, because Dave, Ken does correct me every time I say his name that I've got it wrong. Well, point me to that. Point me to that on Amazon. Actually, I'm quite interested in that. But, you know, going back to the falsification of science, I mean, I think that what happens is that the powers that be, uh, the bankers, if you like, they present us with these these fakes, these frauds, people like Einstein, people like, you know, in more modern times, people like Stephen Hawking. I mean, to me, I, I think, I don't think he bloody exists, that guy. I think, I think that is just, I mean, he's the only man who's ever managed to live 50 years with, with whatever disease, motor neuron disease is it. He's the only man that's ever managed to live so long with that disease. I, I cannot believe that he is genuine at all. Now, anybody else would have been dead 50 years ago. The, the survival rate is, is, is zero, basically. But he's lived into his 70s, apparently. Anyway, so there's him. And then you get these other, these even more modern ones. The, the, I'm thinking of the guy now. I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. Um, um, is is the BBC put him on in a lot of physics programs? Is like the the popular f Brian Cox. That's him. What a git he is! I mean, please, you know, absolute, you know, dickhead. Yeah, dickhead, basically. Where they got him from, I have no idea. So that guy is a professor. He should be bloody well ashamed of himself, actually. Well, he's a keyboard Reference player, and he was, the devil, he, is. He, he was a keyboard player with D. Ream, wasn't he? Single-handedly responsible for Tony Blair getting elected. So, you know, that yeah. says it all for me. Well, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, I don't want to single him out. I don't want to be unfair and single him out. Because, I mean, there's hundreds of the buggers, but, um, the, you yeah, know. Let's the... be unfair, he's a wanker. That's, <laughs> that all he, that's all he is. He's just a complete wanker. Yeah, I mean, come off the there's loads of them about. Like, they're just everywhere. Eamon Holmes, just yeah. a complete wanker. Yeah, yeah, yeah but at least he doesn't pretend everywhere. to be uh, clever. You know, <laughs> he's just. A... <laughs> uh, I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, I mean, there's other these pseudo scientists that they put on. There's a there's a a woman she used to do it like with a Bristol accent. She used to Alice somebody. She used to do a lot of um, so-called biological programs, which just seemed to me to be a front for promoting evolution as being the absolute holy truth, you know. Um can't remember a surname. Is that Alice Roberts? It. Yes, that's her, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the BBC are just full of people like that. And, and it's like they wheel them out. There you go, you wind them up, off they go. You know, and they spew out all this rubbish and garbage. And all it is, it's just absolute propaganda to, to, to propagandise people into believing whatever crap they want us to believe at the time. Well, mm. it's, it's the same thing with evolution. I mean, what, what they do is is we've got this evolution where we evolved from monkeys, and then you think to yourself, well, why are there still monkeys then if we evolved from them? Right? Why are there still monkeys? Right? Mm. And then, but, but the instigating that 
what they call the missing link. So there's a bit of a mystery. Yeah. So people are then looking for that and, and not realising and thinking, hang on a minute. You know, we, we, we've we've yeah. evolved from monkeys. Why is there still monkeys? Exactly. Well, the, one of the biggest killers for me with uh, evolution is the fact is dinosaur bones, right? Mm-hmm. The only actual dinosaur bones in existence are all behind locked doors, allegedly, in uh, in some of the big scientific institutes of the world, like the Smithsonian and British Museum and places like that. There are none on display. All the ones that you see when you go into the British Museum and you see a dinosaur skeleton, it's a fake. You know, it's not a real skeleton because there aren't any. Mm. But they say, oh, no, well, we, we don't put the real ones out because, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, they're too valuable and, you know, we can't, we can't possibly risk them being damaged or broken or destroyed. So, uh, well, we, no, don't worry, though. We've got all the real ones under lock and key, you know. And nobody had ever found any dinosaur skeletons until... Funnily enough, the same decade as evolution was propounded, the 1850s, there were no dinosaur skeletons or bones even found anywhere in the world. And the only ones that get found now are always by establishment scientists. No, you know, no guy with a, a metal detector, not that they're metal, but that kind of guy who goes, you know, amateur sort of uh, fossil collector, uh, never, ever finds anything to do with a dinosaur. Because they just don't bloody well exist, basically. Mm. And I don't, and you know, I absolutely believe that dinosaurs never existed. It's just another uh, facet of them trying to prove to us that evolution is, is, you know, is the holy truth. Mm. So, uh, yes, I mean, I have seen that put forward that the dinosaurs never existed. All the fossils are fake. Where do you stand on the? There's, there seems to be numerous reports of giant human skeletons being found, you know, 10, 15, 20 mm. feet tall. And uh, those bones are, seem to all be taken to the Smithsonian and mm. they never see the light of day again. But you, no, absolutely. You through it's too and, valuable for us plebs to see them. You know, they don't want them broken or lost or damaged, you know. So they've got to put them behind lock and key, uh, Andy. You know, I mean, be fair. Come on. Mm. No, I'm being facetious. No, I just think it's part of the same thing there. Uh-huh. They um, they don't want us to know stuff like that because it contradicts their version of the truth. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether those skeletons are real or not. To, to be frank, I haven't got a clue. But it wouldn't surprise me if they were real. And there is some sort of um, you know, different, diff- well, obviously, different answer to. How we as as a race were, were created. I was going to use the word evolve then, but I don't think it did evolve <laughs> at all. I'm a creationist basically. Um, so you know. So, so how how do what what do you think the, these mammal bipeds uh, that are inhabiting this this planet that we're on um, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years? How do you what what do you think happened to the, spark the, the the progress we've had in technology in the last 200 years in the last 200 years well yeah i mean we've had a, a huge technology um rush that's gone on from from 200 years ago to now i mean the, the technology's exponentially exploded i mean what, what it has was there any particular thing that happened at any point in time yeah, well, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that now. I, I really don't. But I, I know that that has happened on several separate occasions going back through time. Um, there's been, you know, the, the first major one was 5,000 years ago when all of a sudden what we're told were these creatures that had evolved from chimpanzees or apes of some sort. Suddenly, a civilization sprang up from nothing 5,000 years ago in Babylon. But even more than that, Quite separately and quite distant from each other, other civilizations sprang up in the Indus Valley, which is in you know the the near to, to sorry the middle to far east, on the edge of what is now India, uh, and also the Aztec Inca civilizations and the Egyptian civilizations also sprung up more or less at the same time, quite independently of each other. Now you know. This is the best answer because I can't answer you 200 years ago. There has been other instances of, of things like that happening quite spontaneously, they say. But you know, I, I, 
I'm not flattering to the answer, I'm afraid. Or I don't have the knowledge to answer that. It's more to the point. Well, also, when we, we're talking about the falsification of science and history, which I think the two are linked exactly when you look at Egypt. Absolutely. Because you, you get John Anthony West and Robert Schock seem to prove pretty conclusively that the Sphinx is 25,000 years old plus. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're told by people like Zahi Hawass, who mm. seems to be just a gatekeeper, he's, he's just after protecting yes. his own job and the industry of Egyptology, we're yeah. told that, that no civilization as such existed. We were all hunter-gatherers up until 5,000 years ago. Mm. And um, that kind of conflicts with what happens when you look at Gobekli Tepe, which was um, deliberately buried... Uh, about 12,000 years ago. Mm. So uh, a hunter-gatherer society could not have possibly built something so technologically advanced and complex as Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all fascinating stuff. Uh, and, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be interested to look into it a lot more than I already have. But, um, you know, uh, I don't have the answers to that, really. No, well, I've got on my reading list, I've got, um, I believe it's Andrew Collins wrote the book on Gobekli Tepe, because um, when my good lady was looking for Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods, that, for, not Fingerprints, sorry, uh, Magicians of the Gods, the latest version, uh, that book came up and she thought, oh, oh, I'll get him that one as well. So... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading a bit more about Gobekli Tepe because uh, it really has caught my imagination. I suppose yeah. not least because Turkey is one of my favourite places to visit. I, I, I find it's got an astounding history, absolutely mm. fascinating place yeah. and such warm people to meet. Uh, it kind of conflicts with the story we're getting in the, the press about Turkey, but um, for me, <laughs> it's a marvellous place. Yeah, well, that can't be a bad thing, conflicting with the uh, mainstream press, can it, really? <laughs> no. <you don't. laughs> yeah, I mean, if anybody's interested in looking into, you know, the truth about evolution, creation, whatever, um, there's another book I'd recommend. I'm sorry to keep doing this, but it's um, it's by a guy called James Perloff, who's an American guy, and uh, it's called Tornado in a Junkyard. And basically the title of the book is about, you know, the, the, the actual creation of the human body uh, is about as likely through evolution as it would be as a tornado going through a junkyard and constructing a, a, a Boeing 747 out of it. Absolutely. Whereas, yes. Yeah. And that ties in with a video that was recommended to me recently. I think it was by Tony. And that's called, um, it's by a guy called Michael Behe, B-E-H-E. And I'm sure the title of the lecture is called Irreducible Complexity. Yes. And it, it shows you some, some tiny, tiny um, organisms that, that couldn't possibly have come into existence by evolution. They, yeah. they must have, have appeared at some point fully formed because each part yeah. of it cannot function without the other part. Well, that's that's one of the um, creationists' arguments, isn't it? That irreducible complexity. Mm. Like it's like they, they use the eye as an example, and I think it's a particularly good example, whether it be a, a human eye or the eye of any living creature. It's impossible that all the component parts of an eye could have evolved into what it is now because and it's quite simple proof against evolution because it, it, it you know it, it can't sort of partially evolve into you know a partially working organ i mean how does it suddenly become an eye you know with all the complex you know uh workings and machinations about how an eye actually works all the different you know parts of it it could, just couldn't suddenly appear. And how does it evolve? Because the only way that you can, because the, the evolutionists claim that, um, you know, it, it's by natural selection. So an animal will suddenly acquire one mutation that is beneficial to it. And so that will remain in its, in its gene pool and it will reproduce. So if, 
it can't suddenly just acquire an eye and then from there on that that animal has an eye and and that's true of lots and lots of different organs and that's the irreducible complexity argument against evolution because it, you can't have a part of an eye you know you can't just suddenly say I'm, I'm struggling here to get my point across but i think i hope i'm being understood you know Absolutely, yeah. But eyes, eyes made up of so many components. The, 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 yeah. the lens, there's the pupil. The, the, sorry, pupil is the lens. The iris, there's the rods, the cones. Yeah. I mean, you can't just sort of have a. Well, it, it's nearly an eye, can you? No. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Tony said, um, "Yeah, it was him." Obviously, he said that. Um, if anyone wants the video, he's happy to send it to him. So if you go in the chat room and send a private message to Tony Hurst, he'll send you a link to that or send you the video because it's not available on SpewTube, apparently. Nice one. Yeah, so that, I mean, that was just, I know we digressed a little bit or two, um, falsification of science. But there's all sorts of other things. I've kind of just touched briefly on them for me. You know, all these fake scientists, like I've sort of given a few examples, but there's hundreds of them. The people have sold their souls to the devil. They don't really believe what they're promoting. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's part of the celebrity cult almost, you know. Mm. And then there's things like global warming. I mean, everybody knows. Everybody with, you know, a quarter of a brain <laughs> knows that global warming is just a complete scam. I mean, the science behind that is just absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, but if you pay more tax, it will solve it. Of course, yeah, yeah. But do you think as well? We we start in the alternative media. We're starting to uh, mirror that in the in the mainstream. We're starting to have these people that are, uh, you know, the go to people for certain issues, whereas perhaps we, we should be diversifying a little bit further. And speaking to more people, more obscure, different people. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't really understand the point you're making then, Jason. Well, what I'm saying is, it, as you said, the, the, in the mainstream media, they've got these uh, these talking heads that they refer yeah. to, you know, yeah. Brian Cox, all these things. Now, what I'm saying is that don't you think that we're starting to mimic that in the alternative media and alternative uh, thinking websites and, and, and uh, you know, shows and, and different things? That we, we're starting to mimic that we've got a go-to person and, and, and they're the uh, number one um, so, so we're going for a name rather than the information itself yeah possibly yeah you, what you think of people like David Icke or you know that kind yeah, of thing about, yeah the, 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 I'm not not particularly uh, specifically David Icke but you know David Icke Alex Jones yeah, yeah. Uh, all all the all the, the the regular people, you know, that that sort of seem to pop up everywhere, and and when their influence, and when the size and their influence changes, and so does so does the narrative. It seems to change as well. I mean, I've noticed mm. that with Infowars recently. Yeah. That narrative seems to have changed quite a lot, and they've got really really big. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But is that have they got really, really big because they've somehow been infiltrated and taken over? Mm. You've, you've always got to ask that question. And Jason, this is kind of work like magic. Um, what you've just been talking about there has led perfectly into Doc Rock Show that's coming up in just under five minutes now. Because tonight, the Doc Rock's radio show is all about the Dark Mountain Project, and he's going to be joined by Nick Hunt and Steve Wheeler to discuss the Dark Mountain Project at darkmountain.net, and apparently a network of writers, artists, and thinkers who have stopped believing the story of our, our civilization is telling itself. In a world that is founded on stories of all kinds, the network encourages investigation of modern myths that define our ideas of civilization and consideration of the imminent consequences of our beliefs. So, aha. That's more or less exactly what we've been talking about, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So, we, we've just been here for two hours giving a, a good old build up for the doc, even though we didn't realize we were doing it, but 
you know, <laughs> it, it's always a, a worthwhile cause. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd like to say we're getting right to the end of the show now, John. Um, have you got any links to give out where people can contact you or find any more information, or is it just the the yeah, Amazon? Well, I've actually got a Twitter account now. I'm, I'm not really a big social media fan, but I've just basically done it to to get the word out. So I, I'm at John Hamer author, my Twitter. And also um, it, the, the actual link to my author page on Amazon, <laughs> that terrible organization. Um, it, it's not a short uh, URL. So all I would say is go to Amazon.com co.uk amazon.com and just type my name in john hamer and it'll bring up my my page with all my books on yeah i, d- I did a search earlier on and it pr- came up pretty much right at the very top yes that's yeah. fabulous well i'd like to say a big thank you for joining us again john and uh i'm looking forward to coming up to to your part of the world in september and uh hopefully we'll we'll meet you for a pint and uh, absolutely yeah, drag jason to-